Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining our webinar this morning. Uh, we, we're quite excited about what we have coming up. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, panelists and, um, and the subject in a moment, but uh, I'd like to start with some housekeeping. Um, please feel free to engage with us and the panelists throughout the webinar. Uh, you'll notice the, um, uh, uh, the box at the bottom that allows you to um, ask questions. Please do submit your questions there. And we'll try to ensure as many of those are responded to as possible. Um, I will also just advise the room that we're, we're quite uh, happy and quite excited that we also have Sanas in the room with us today. Uh, the DTI are also, um, uh, and the DTI are also uh, joining us, as well as a number of members from the ABP Association for BE Professionals. Um, so. I'm going to start by asking Dumisani from the ABP uh, to speak a little bit more about who the ABP is, uh, what they do, and uh, particularly uh, their focus areas during times of COVID. Dumisani. Uh, you're muted, Dumisani. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Lee, for the opportunity. And greetings to the moderator. Uh, for the... Uh, good morning to the fellow uh, the panelists, Gade uh, Mohale, Gade Mbeki, Tesh. And uh, last but not least, uh, good morning to all the, the participants. Um, I think, you know, uh, as a way of um, introduction, I think uh, it's our Great pleasure as the industry body, you know, um, uh, to participate uh, in this session organized by one of our members. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's a great uh, initiative. Uh, it fosters a culture of debate and discussion around issues of PE. Um, if it was not a webinar, I would be, you know, asking the audience to give the PE Innovation team a round of applause. Uh, congratulations to you, Lee, and the team. Uh, great work. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to be sharing this, uh, you know, uh, for the opportunity to share some, some thoughts on behalf of the industry um, uh, and also, you know, uh, 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 with this impressive lineup of speakers that we have here. I'm particularly happy uh, uh, to see uh, Tade Bonang uh, in the lineup, someone who I've uh, worked with closely uh, in the PMF and other platforms. I'm, I'm always intrigued uh, uh, by his unwavering commitment towards transformation and his courageous leadership. Um, uh, throughout your career uh, as, a, as a retiree, uh, you have uh, uh, taught us uh, through your good deeds um, that uh, you know uh, you can't shout transformation if um, you are not exemplary a uh, transformation agent in your own sphere of influence. You know you you have given a meaning to the old adage that uh, be the change that you wish to see. And I hope we can, you know, take something there as, as, as uh, you know, a PE practitioners that in our own companies we must portray uh, that which we believe in. After all, uh, charity begins at home. Um, and uh, once again, thanks for the opportunity as the ABP to participate here. I think in terms of the topic, if I can just uh, get quickly into the topic, uh, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a panelist, but just to, you know, share my quick thoughts on the topic. I think the first point that needs to be made is that uh, the economic and political cost of inequality are so great that no one will want to live in a country ravaged by inequality, at least of all uh, racial inequality, uh, because no economy can grow in a sustainable way when its majority are excluded uh, and, and where we are, you know, the country is actually underutilizing its uh, human resource base. And we all know that uh, such inequality would lead to political instability but also it's politically corrosive and uh, might lead, uh, you know, uh, or might compromise uh, all the efforts of nation building and social cohesion. So it is a problem that um, everybody agrees and we accept that uh, it's an issue that we need to deal with as a country. But as a country throughout the years, we've been grappling with this issue of transformation and empowerment uh, through employment equity, legislation, social procurement, and, and many other interventions that the government have come up with and different efforts in the private sector 
that we have been trying, but we have not been able to, you know, um, to achieve a, a sustainable progress um, a, a, in, in terms of the, 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 the transformation. And in my view, it's because we are dealing with a solid uh, economic architecture that is so strong that unless something drastic happens to change its course, it simply reproduces uh, racial inequality. And of course, there are voices uh, that argue that the architect of this sort of economy is so strong and structural that uh, you, you can't simply transform it. Uh, uh, you'll have to bring it to its knees and rebuild it afresh if you want to achieve transformation. And uh, well, um, uh, uh, it's, it's not the social connectivists who have brought it to its knees. Uh, strangely, it's the COVID, uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and so one can argue that COVID has gifted the country with an opportunity to build a new economy, an economy, uh, you know, um, uh, with explicit defined, uh, uh, if, I, if you like, new economic ethos, you know, that current does not exist in the economic architecture that we have in this country. A growing economy, um, is first one. Uh, second one, an employment creating economy. Thirdly, a diversified economy. And fourthly, an inclusive economy. If the rebuilding of our economy post COVID is to be premised on these new ethos, then one can argue that BE must be at the epicenter of that rebuilding and reconstruction. Because otherwise, you're not going to be able to achieve a growing economy when you use you know, 10% of your population to drive the economic growth. You're not going to achieve you know, a, a employment creating economy when only few participate in the economy. I never submit that BE is even more relevant now than it has ever been. But if BE is to be at the epicenter of this rebuilding and reconstruction, then this will mean that uh, uh, we need even a stronger and credible cadre of BE practitioners. Uh, and at even consultants, you know, uh, BE consult verification agencies, a, a analysts, and, and even industry practitioners that are sitting within corporates. But unfortunately, our sector has been infiltrated by unscrupulous people who want to make a quick buck you know, and, and, and help perpetuate funding by circumventing processes. Although there are few, they make so much headlines and they make all of us look bad as practitioners in the space. What we need to do, we need to regain the public confidence and trust into our profession. And, uh, you know, um, if we do that, we'll be able to be recognized as a catalyst, you know, for, for this economic rebuilding. The only way we can do that is by uniting behind a strong professional body that instills the highest level of ethical conduct and professionalism in the, in, in the sector and in its members. This is what ABP is about. This is what ABP does. ABP is a professional body registered with SACWA. You know, uh, our mandate primarily is to maintain oversight uh, of the knowledge, skills, conduct, and practice of this profession. But we can only achieve this, uh, you know, through professional certification. We actually had a designation. Uh, that we, you know, uh, we give to our practitioners uh, the EEP uh, designation, you know, to recognize uh, the competence and confirm the commitment of these professionals into the into the, the profession. But we also administer continued professional development, which ensures that practitioners maintain and enhance the knowledge and systems they need to deliver, uh, you know, um, as a professional service to their clients and the country as a whole. Imagine being flown around the world with a, you know, by a pilot who doesn't have knowledge and skills uh, to use the latest navigation systems. That's, that's, that is the importance of CBP points. And if you know, a practitioner is not part of, C, of, of, of ABP and is missing out on these opportunities, he's like a pilot who doesn't know how to navigate the latest navigation systems. But even more importantly, we, made, we maintain a strict code of ethics and conduct, you know, um, you know, so that we can hold each other accountable you know, and protect uh, the, the occupation. So this then begs the question, if you are, a, a, if you are not a member of ABP, why not? And, and, the, and this question is being, you know, the market is beginning to ask this question. Um, you know, uh, uh, if you're not a member, why, why not? If you do not want to be held by your peers to the highest professional standards and ethics, how can your client trust that you will act uh, uh, ethically and professionally? And, and, and where would your client uh, or, or member of the public report your misconduct if you are not a member of a professional body? If you don't want to attend continued professional development, you know, which will have professional training to sharpen your skills and so on, how can your client and, your, and the country and the public at large trust your level of competence? So, so, so uh, as I end, um, you know, a program director, um, uh, you know, as, as ABP in response to the COVID-19, 
we have set up uh, an, an, an emergency committee to help cushion the industry against the impact of COVID-19. You know, the primary mandate of this, uh, you know, uh, committee is to protect lives first and contain the, the spread of the, the COVID-19 in our sector. Uh, but secondly, we want to promote and preserve the integrity of our profession and occupation at this difficult time. As, as one could argue that uh, BE is on the back foot because of this COVID-19. We need to make sure that our practitioners are protected, but also need to provide support to our members uh, during this difficult time. We have a webinar next week scheduled on Tuesday, 10 o'clock. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we'll be you know, uh, just unpacking the relief measures that our members can, you know, can take advantage of. Uh, there are also groundbreaking thoughts and ideas that have emerged uh, through our discussion in that committee, which I so happen to chair, that emergency committee. Uh, we'll be taking up those discussions with the DTIC and SANAS on behalf of the sector. But also there are incentives meant to equip and support members. So members who are not uh, ABP need to you know, start uh, getting closer to ABP. In conclusion, um, uh, this is a clarion call to all those uh, BE practitioners out there uh, that are not ABP members. Uh, that they must uh, join and be part of this new chain of true empowerment and, and inclusivity because we all need the practitioners to actually drive the sector and make sure that we are a catalyst for a transformed uh, economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dumisani. So uh, the ABP uh, is an important body uh, for BE professionals. So please do, um, if you're not a member, please do take a look at them and uh, make sure that you join as well. So um, who's BE Innovation? We're a BE and Transformation Consultancy. We handhold our clients through the BE process to help them ensure that they're not just compliant with BE, but that we implement solutions that uh, try to positively impact your bottom line, but more importantly, also make a difference to people who need it the most, the people in society who are disenfranchised many times by no choice of their own. Uh, we also help companies implement the YES initiative, um, and we also ensure that your skills development and your CETA submissions align with your BE requirements so that you can not only claim grant funding, but you can also uh, get as many points as possible from your BE scorecard. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to your uh, esteemed panel moderator. Uh, she's the CEO of the Peter Maritzburg and Midlands Chamber of Business. Um, and we're very grateful that she agreed to uh, run this panel for us as well. She's done many other events and panels for us in the past. And she's, she's really great at what she does. And you'll see why we keep choosing her. Thank you very much. Melanie Vaness, please, uh, from here, all yours. Ah, thank you very much, Lee. And welcome to everybody. Um, I don't know why Lee keeps thanking me. Um, I come from strong Irish heritage, so um, a debate is like a, a sport for me. It's uh, something that I enjoy immensely, and uh, so it's a privilege to be here today, especially with a, a panel like we have um, with us, a panel that, um, that disagree um, on particular view, which is, which is really important because if you hang around with like-minded people, um, it doesn't really ever drive any, um, any growth in, in anybody. So I want to start by saying, there are three things that, um, that actually uh, drive me crazy. Injustice, dogma, um, and illogical rules. So uh, these are the things that set me off. Um, I want to start by just saying that, reminding everybody that the truth that you hold um, is chosen. You choose your particular perspective on things, um, and uh, a lot of people hang on to that. Um, so I'm going to invite you today to do something that one of our panelists actually, um, Weletsi, once said to me that I've never forgotten and that's uh, always stuck with me. And that is that if you're going into a situation um, of, uh, of potential conflict or a situation where the person holds an alternative view to you, go in being 100% prepared to be convinced of the other person's point of view. And if at the end of really listening, you're unconvinced, then prepare yourself to convince. So I invite you today to come in with that mindset and to bear in mind that I'm here to poke the bear and poke the bear I will. So on that basis, I'm going to invite our panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Tash, a uh, lady after my own heart, passionate about empowering the youth. Um, before you come on, I just want to say that this is not a debate about uh, whether this country needs transformation. It's not a debate about whether uh, it's okay to have uh, 
the kind of society that we have that is the most unequal in the world. Um, I think we can all agree that it's totally unacceptable. Um, and a debate really is whether we're on the right path to solving that. Having said that, uh, Tash, may I invite you please to introduce yourself. Thank you. So I'm uh, Tash Mirai Ismail. I'm the Chief Executive of the Youth Employment Service. My um, initial training in life was in the medical field. So I'm a scientist at heart um, and then went on to do an MBA and taught at uh, several business schools uh, in the States, in uh, the Netherlands and in South Africa at Gibbs. Uh, and, and a big subject um, area that I went quite deeply into was inclusive business. Um, how we can use uh, business and the um, performance and metrics of business to try to drive uh, development. So it was, it was part of this whole global thinking around sustainability, capitalism for good, business for good. Um, and the, the BE codes are a lovely vehicle to be able to institute that kind of thinking, a new form of capitalism that isn't just about for profit motives of an organization, but really how an organization grows in tandem with the society that it operates in. Now, I'm, I'm not a fan of the entire BE scorecard or the entire model. I do think it gets wrapped up in, in a lot of detail that makes it difficult to apply in, in some cases. Uh, but I think that there are elements of the BE scorecard that can be powerful, powerful drivers and incentivize business uh, to make slightly different decisions about the way they drive business models. Our, our dean at the business school used to always say, and, and Bonang knows uh, Nick Benedel well, uh, he was the previous uh, dean of, of uh, Gibbs Business School, and he would say, you can't have a, a company without a country. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Youth Employment Service was created as an innovation um, between business, government, and labor to say, how do we incentivize and reward businesses for behavior that drives inclusivity? And so the Government Gazette on uh, the BE amendment um, allowed the Youth Employment Service to come into being. And this rewards companies with one or two levels on the BE scorecard if they're investing in jobs for black youth one-year work experiences for black youth. Now we know that a one-year work experience is a powerful mover for a young person. Um, many employers need to see uh, a young person de-risked before they're willing to brave the labor laws and take them into their organization. So that year of work experience with a CV and a, and a reference letter has empirically been shown to dramatically improve the chances of a young person getting employment beyond that. Psychologically, this year for a young person who's never been in the workplace is also a, a really important psychological mover for the young person to understand that they belong and can participate in the world of work um, and, and, and breaks the drought in many cases where, where young people just can't get that foot in the door. So we've, through this, this, this amendment to the codes, which we worked on with the DTI for about a year and a half, um, uh, through these codes, we've been able to create over 35,000 employment opportunities for youth within the space of 16 months. That's a big number. If you, if you know uh, the South African economy and you know the numbers, 35,000 jobs in the space of time is, 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 miracle, is miracle work. This puts 1.4 billion in salaries into youth wallets across the country. And we know that youth wallets have a big multiplier because they spend locally. So it's a, it's a great way to drive uh, inclusive growth by allowing young people who are shut out of the economy a foot into the economy. Now, prior to my yes, uh, yes work, um, I, I authored several case studies, not just in South Africa, but globally, wrote a book <coughs> called New Markets, New Mindsets. And all of this, uh, all of this work showcased companies um, growing, their, growing local economies, growing communities, growing incomes in communities uh, in sustainable fashion and at the same time growing their business. And we see in, in, in the BE codes many um, vehicles and tools 
to be able to achieve the same thing and get your company rewarded for it. And yes is, yes is built exactly like that. You can be doing the right thing. You can be driving employment numbers. You can be putting money into youth wallets at community level. Those jobs in turn have social impacts. A lot of our youth jobs are in the healthcare sector, early childhood development, uh, food security. And you can be growing your company's BE level, which opens you up for a whole lot more opportunity. So that's a little bit about uh, my history in inclusive business, the youth employment service activity, and the impact that we've had so far. Thank you so much, Tash. Bonang, you've never been afraid to um, uh, say something your mind, and uh, it's one of the things that I enjoy immensely about you. Bonang Mahale, please introduce yourself. Bonang Mahale, I'm the Chancellor of the University of the Free State. I am a professor of practice at the Johannesburg Business School in the Faculty of Business and Economics. And I am the chairman of the Bidvest Group Limited. Thank you, Melanie. Appreciate it. One of my favorite people in the world, in the world Moelezi Mbeki, um, who probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'm going to invite him to introduce himself anyway. And, uh, and I'd like him to start the discussion um, around BE. Um, well, let's see, you've been involved with BE since its inception. Can you tell us where BE um, originated? Where did it come from? Whose idea was it? How did we land up with BE? Uh, <coughs> thank you, Melanie, and uh, good morning to everybody on the uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Mwelet Mbeki. Uh, I have uh, two backgrounds uh, which might uh, explain my uh, ways of thinking. Uh, one of my background, which came from my, from my family, uh, my mother was one of the most radical women in South Africa. Uh, she came from the Mwerane family in the Eastern Cape in the Sesotho-speaking part of the Eastern Cape. And uh, in 1936, she joined the Communist Party when she was a student. And uh, she used to say that she recruited my father to join the Communist Party, although my father denied that. Uh, he said he did it all by himself. Uh, so I have that side of, uh, of my background. Uh, my parents owned a general dealership in the Transkei, uh, just outside uh, Dutra. So we have a business background. We have both a communist background and a business background. Uh, in terms of my training, I studied building and building management uh, in the United Kingdom. And I worked in the construction industry uh, there with the big construction companies. Uh, at, uh, somewhere in the 70s, I worked for the Tanzanian state-owned enterprise. That was my first encounter with state-owned enterprises and, uh, and my first taste of corruption in the state-owned enterprises. So the, the corruption you see in the South African state-owned enterprises, I can assure you, is a very traditional African thing, this corruption. Uh, my state-owned enterprise I worked for in Tanzania was of the building professions, architects, quantity surveyor, and, and so on. And, uh, and I was a quantity surveyor in that. And one of my uh, encounters with corruption was the general manager. <clears throat> I was a quantity surveyor for uh, a, a barracks, for the building of a barracks just outside Dar es Salaam. And the general manager of the company used to take cement from, from, the, uh, from the barracks construction site to go and build his own house. And uh, so I complained to him about it. That uh, And uh, so anyway, that was, that was part of, of my training. But I'm also a sociologist. So... Uh, one of my specialties, the economic history of South Africa, uh, which uh, is a subject which has always interested me. Uh, so to cut a very long story short, uh, my main, uh, one of my main occupations 
was I became, after I came back from exile, I was head of communication for COSATU for three years from 1990 to 93. And then I became a, a, an entrepreneur of my, on my own. One of my jobs was as a political analyst for NetBank. So for many years, I, was a, I, I did presentations to asset managers in South Africa and in the United Kingdom on behalf of, of, uh, of, of NetBank. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a private entrepreneur. I set up uh, a construction company. Uh, we built the Sheraton in Pretoria. Uh, and by the way, this was not a BE company. We, it was owned by myself and my partner, Kapometsi Maleke and Josh Nkosi. We set up the company and uh, and we built uh, we built the Sheraton we 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 built uh, part of the huge prison uh, in Louis Trichard. there's a 3000 bed privately run prison in Louis Trichard. our company which was called Makosi Holdings uh, built 3000 1000 of uh, of those 3000 beds in in the prison which was a bit ironic since my father spent 25 years in prison on Robben Island, but uh, that was one of those things. But now this was a democratic prison, which is a high security prison uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Louis Chichard now called Makada. There's another prison like that in Bloemfontein, another one in Kokstad. Uh, these are privately run prisons under the government's supervision. Um, and so, but I, I also established a business uh, called, uh, called KMM, uh, which we publish books. Uh, our, our latest book is the, the, the biography of Robert Sobukwe, which is a new biography uh, by uh, Tamika Plaki. Uh, we also published a book uh, on the economy of South Africa uh, by Philip Berger. Uh, the Professor Philip Berger is head of the economics department at the University of the Free State. Uh, but we published other writers. We've done a history of uh, uh, Forte. We've written, bio, published a biography of Sam Mutsonyane and so on. Now you ask me where I first came across BEE. Well, I came across BEE in 1991 uh, when I was with COSATU. We were monitoring uh, what initiatives were, were happening in the country about changing the economy of South Africa. Uh, 1991 in terms of the economy, of course, these were very heady days. It was the beginning of CODESA and, and COSATU was part of CODESA of the ANC negotiating team. So we, I, I attended, I monitored what big business was doing and they had something called the D group, which was convened uh, by a former journalist of the Transvala uh, called Otto Krause. Otto Krause had been editor of the Transvala. The Transvala was the Booth's newspaper, by the way, but he had called for the release of Mandela, and, and so he was fired for his trouble. Anyway, he set up this uh, uh, D group, D for development, and the big uh, captains of industry attended. Uh, I think there were monthly meetings uh, at his uh, huge apartment in Parktown North. <clears throat> and I attended, of course, on behalf of Consar to, to try and hear what these folks were plotting behind our backs. And uh, one day there was a presentation by the then uh, Director General of uh, the Department of Trade and Industry in 91. This was uh, Steph Nodier was his name. Uh, and Steph Nodier explained that there is a new 
thinking about the way the economy is going. And uh, there is something called black economic empowerment uh, that, that is, is, is being uh, thought about and that this is going to be, and he explains a, li a little bit what, what it was about, uh, a transfer of assets to black people so that they can be part of the economy. So during the, 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 the break, I, 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 I went to Stefano Dier to say I disagree with this transfer uh, of resources. What, what we need in South Africa is more entrepreneurs from the black community. Uh, we don't need uh, people who are uh, acquiring existing assets. We need people who can create new assets and add value to the economy. <clears throat> then Steph Nodier said, oh, by the way, this is not my idea. Uh, here is the phone number of the man behind this idea. And the man behind the number uh, was a, a, a guy, the brother of the then uh, Minister of Finance, uh, Baron Duplessis. And the brother was Ati Duplessis. So he said, you go and talk to these guys. They are the ones who, 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 whose idea it is. So when I, I phoned Ati Duplessis um, and, uh, and I arranged to meet with him. So I had a meeting with him and, um, and Dave, Dave Brink, who, who was uh, uh, then a head of uh, Murray and Roberts. It turned out that at this, these two gentlemen uh, were working for a company called Suncorp. Suncorp was the industrial division uh, of Sunlam. And uh, so they gave me tea and biscuits and explained, uh, and I explained to them why I don't agree with their model. I said, we need a model that will give us entrepreneurs not a model that will give us rich men uh, who are not entrepreneurs. Uh, so they listened very, uh, very patiently to my plea with them to change their model. And they told me that, oh, sorry, but our, our, our project is already very far advanced. Maybe next time we'll think of it. Uh, of what you are saying, but for now we we have to go out ahead with what. And the this led to the their model was the creation of New Africa Investment Limited, a company called Nail. Uh, the model was that uh, they selected a number of black leaders, anti-apartheid leaders, uh, to buy, and I put buy in inverted commas because these guys didn't put any money since they didn't have any, to buy Metropolitan Life. Uh, and Metropolitan Life was restructured. It was a listed company into high voting shares and low voting shares. And the new black owners <coughs> who were led by Dr. Mutlana, uh, acquired the, the high voting shares, which were uh, about 10% of the, of the actual shareholding of the company. But in order to acquire that 10%, they, they, it was facilitated for them by ATI to, to go and uh, uh, to get a loan from Industrial Development Corporation, IDC, uh, so that's how they bought their, their 10% of, of, the share, of the shareholding in, in metropolitan life. So that was, uh, in a way, the first uh, black economic empowerment. Now, what was the thinking behind that? The thinking behind that really was to get a buy-in from the black leadership like Dr. Mutlana, Sam Mutsonyane, Dihang, Museneke, they selected uh, the, the, the black leadership at the time and to get them to embrace the capitalist system. 
and to buy in into the capitalist system by becoming rich men themselves through this model. Now, my objection, as I said, I said we need entrepreneurs. Uh, that model was not an entrepreneurial meeting. It was a model for buying off uh, the, 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 the leaders uh, of, of, of this, of this uh, struggle against apartheid. And first, I didn't think that was a good idea, but, but leaving that aside economically, I, what I would have preferred was that we set up a venture capital bank or something like that, and then support uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, so that was my model. My model was to, 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 to support entrepreneurs, uh, but their model wa wa was to, to, to get the, the political leadership to become stakeholders uh, into some of the companies of, 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 uh, of the big corporations. Anglo-American followed suit with, with its own version, and before long, uh, this was like a white fire that went through the country. And so why did these guys want to, to, to co-opt the anti-apartheid leadership in the country? One of the biggest fears of, of, of big business at the time was the Freedom Charter, uh, because the Freedom Charter of the ANC uh, had a nationalization clause in it. Uh, uh, to nationalize, according to the Freedom Charter, the banks, the mines, and the monopoly industries. So this was a big fear by big business that they had to get uh, to win, so to speak, uh, the black leadership from the mindset of nationalization and to accept the, uh, the, the status quo, so to speak, uh, of, of the economy. Uh, so it was marketed as if it was to address the inequalities of the past. And it has been, I must say, a, a wonderful marketing game. I wish I, wish I can get the, the people behind that marketing strategy to market our books because we would sell millions and millions. It has, it's been a fantastic marketing, the black economic empowerment, because the whole political agenda behind it, which is the co-option of the leadership of the black people, it has disappeared. Disappeared completely. It's been whitewashed, washed out of the thing. Uh, and what do we have today? We have a totally untransformed economy of South Africa. But we have our former leaders, and I was in the ANC all my life, we have our former leaders dancing to big business and retaining the structure of the South African economy. And the South African economy it was set up by the British at the end of the 19th century and, and just after the Anglo-Boer War. And that we are a raw material exporting economy. We export metals, we export minerals, and we export agricultural products. So if you look at our economy today, which is the structure that BEE was designed to perpetuate, is the structure that you have today, which was the economic system of South Africa that the British designed. Uh, to export minerals to, uh, and, and, and to export agricultural products, to retain the migrant labor system, that, that this whole uh, mining industry was, was founded on, and it continues to operate on, the, or, or, on that migrant labor system, which, it, which we all know what the consequences of our migrant labor system uh, have been. So my model, is to industrialize South Africa uh, by creating those, that section of the population who were excluded from entrepreneurship under the apartheid system, under uh, the, the job reservation system before apartheid. My model is to get, to encourage and to assist 
people to diversify the South African economy, to diversify our export basket, to, to have new industries. Uh, if you look closely at the South African economy, we, many, we've had all these black economic empowerment companies and tycoons and so on. Uh, but what has happened to, to, to for example, to, to our manufacturing uh, industry? As, the, manuf as the, 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 the BE companies have been growing and BE has been growing, our manufacturing companies have been shrinking. Our manufacturing sector has been shrinking. Our unemployment has been growing while BEE companies are growing, which shows that BEE is not adding value to the economy of South Africa. Because if it were adding value, then our, as BEE grows, then our unemployment should be shrinking instead of growing. And our basket of exports should be changing from the, the, the mineral uh, basket and agriculture basket with a, uh, an, uh, an enclave economy of the kind of the automobile industry, uh, that, which is the, the, what, we, what we have in, the, in this country. So BE, uh, in concluding moderator for now, uh, in my view, uh, BE has been uh, a disservice to the economy of South Africa. Uh, it, it, it should be scrapped. Uh, whether we, we have COVID-19 or no, we don't have COVID-19, I think it should be scrapped. And it should be replaced with an entrepreneur development program where we then start new industry. One of the key characteristics of South Africa during the last 25 years is that we have no new industries uh, have emerged in South Africa other than the telephony, which is a new technology, the cellular te telephony. Where we don't have new manufacturing industries. If you look at China during the same time as us, you have companies like, like uh, uh, Mars uh, companies, you have a huge diversification of the Chinese economy to become a, a manufacturing exporter. The, but, but our economy remains a, a raw material exporter. So that, in a nutshell, is why I think let's get be out of the way. The rich politicians who made money out of it have made their money anyway. And I suspect they keep their money in Switzerland or wherever rich people in this country keep their money and let's get on with an entrepreneur development program in South Africa. That's the way of the future. Thank, Thank you, you Um in, in view of what Moletsi said, um, Benanga, there, there are people that have undoubtedly benefited from the implementation of BE that have become exceedingly wealthy. Um, and it, it appears that there has been a lot of um, good that's been done in, in um, in terms of the middle class of South Africa, but in, in reaching the really poorest of the poor, it is in your is BE in your opinion having the desired impact? Is it having the impact that was uh, that people intend for it to have? So, this has never been either or, but both end together at the same time, simultaneously, concurrently and in parallel. I think where Mueletsi is absolutely spot on is the fact that the effect of not having changed the economic structure of our economy is that it is still largely premised on three things. It's still a reservoir of cheap labor. Number two, to export the gold and the diamonds to our colonial masters mostly to London, and then lastly, London to determine the price, even though this is our own commodity. So where I come from, really for me, it's the fact that like the National Occupation and Safety Act being the law today that is unaffected by COVID-19, 
so is triple BE. It is the law, and our job is to comply with it whilst questioning how it is being applied. This, to me, was demonstrated by the fact where last week the department claimed victory over Afri Forum and Solidarity in the North Houghton High Court, which reaffirmed the uneven playing field between white and black owned companies created by the country's historical imbalances and confirmed the criteria, the criteria as being well within the law. You see, the North Houghton High Court also agreed with the department that the economic impact of COVID-19 pandemic will result in the closure of black businesses and would undermine and set back transformation. It found nothing racial or shameful in our inclusion of triple BE in the criteria as the applicant sought to suggest. For me, the significant thing is that this was upheld by the Constitutional Court's dismissal of this joint African Forum and Solidarity's application to appeal and set aside the use of triple BE as a criteria for COVID-19. But I think our supreme document is, is, is the Constitution. Therefore, the Constitutional Court considered the application for leave to appeal and concluded that the application should be dismissed as it is not in the interest of justice to hear it. If I go back to section nine, the South African constitution has a general limitation clause. It is based on the fact that even though all of us are equal before the law, section one says, this does not preclude any law program or activity that has at its object, the amelioration of conditions of disadvantaged individuals or groups, including those that are disadvantaged based on race, national, ethnic origin, color, religion, etc. You see, for me, the law without an analysis of power is tyranny. What we are dealing with today in this country, when so many of us dare to hope, is that this is 26 years into democracy and collectively, individually and severally, we have not succeeded in eradicating the 82 years of separate development, the 48 years of apartheid, the 340 years of colonialism. This is despite the fact that not in the main body of the constitution, but in the preamble, the South African constitution, and I talk about the royal we, implores all of us to recognize the injustices of our past but it explicitly mandates Mueleti and myself to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, on social justice and fundamental human rights and improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. It concludes with the hymn, Sigeleli Africa, which has now become a national anthem, which we sing daily and yet we cannot fix the problems of economic justice in this country without first addressing racial justice. The deck has always been stacked against poor people. Economic justice and racial fairness have always been one and the same thing. Asking for a hand up is not the same as asking for a hand out. Triple BE is not a permanent crutch against which black people want to lean for the rest of their lives. I work with Ati Duplessis, and I know that the Africana during 1948, like black people were also outside, barefoot and pregnant. That's how Jenko was created. What COVID-19 has simply done is to demonstrate the huge and deep structural inequality now laid bare for all of us to witness. Grotesque and obscene wealth on the one hand, and grinding, self-perpetuating vicious cycle of abject poverty on the other. The color of COVID-19, like the color of poverty, is still primarily black and feminine. A report by the Office for National Statistics found black women are four times more likely to die with COVID than white women, while black men are more than four times likely to die. 
So COVID-19 has also demonstrated another very disturbing exponential increase in gender-based violence and child abuse. And South Africa has unacceptably high levels of gender-based violence. But you see, Meta Dea Kabinde, the chairperson of the Employment Equity Commission, which has been releasing EE stats for the last 21 years, the 2019 report shows black representations in positions of leadership at a disappointing 14.3%, despite black people constituting more than 90% of the population. Women represent less than 24%, and African women in particular, less than 4% of the C-suite, despite women constituting 51% of the population. Today, we still pay women about 75% of what we pay men for work of equal value. So COVID-19 is everywhere, but countries where women are heads of state, Denmark, New Zealand, Germany, Belgium, Finland, and Iceland, seem to be managing the crisis better because women contribute a much more 360 degree holistic perspective about how companies operate inside societies. It still tends to be assumed that they will take on the majority of both domestic and caring duties, both at home and broader society. So they are generally the ones dealing with the dentists, doctors, schools, care homes, the bus timetables, etc., without fair compensation for such work. I absolutely love what Hawaii has done in introducing this notion of feminist economic recovery plan. Rather than restoring the economy to the old normal, the state is looking to seize the opportunity to build a new system that is capable of delivering gender equality. The proposal includes, amongst others, a universal income grant, special emergency funds for marginalized groups, including undocumented immigrant women, domestic workers, women with disabilities, and sex trafficking survivors. Waived core payments for COVID-19 tests and treatment, including for incarcerated women. They have introduced this notion of a 20% pro rata share of the COVID-19 response funds that expressly cater for the needs of the indigenous population. They are paying $24.80 per hour minimum wage for single mothers. They are providing free, publicly funded childcare for all essential workers. For me, Melanie, four decades have passed since management consultant Marilyn Loden coined this phrase of the glass ceiling to describe this invisible barrier blocking the way for women to progress to senior positions. Despite the hashtag MeToo campaign, and the attention given to the gender pay gap attempts to increase both the number and advancement of women in business are moving excruciatingly slow. The metrics are not showing the direct result of this significant momentum. When your neighbor is hungry, our grandparents used to say, you are the one that cannot sleep at night. From those that more is given, much more it is expected. It is manifestly in the best interest of the haves to take the lead in bringing about and sustaining this world view of abundance precipitated by the love prism in viewing job creation in abundance as creating markets of the future. It is the moral duty of the beneficiaries of patriarchy like myself and Mwelezi and privilege to bring about both gender equality and pay parity in order to attain the ideals of social justice, of nation building, of social coherence, and deliver the South Africa of Holithatha Nelson Mandela's dreams. We dare not give up uh, on that miracle. We need to continue to dream of the South Africa that all of us have been praying for, the South Africa of our grandfather's dreams. I'm hoping that is helpful, Melody. But then it's, it's very difficult to disagree with anything you have to say. I think we all have that wonderful dream for our country. Um, and uh, when you start talking about issues of women empowerment, you know you're going to take us down an entirely different path, um, one that I 100% support. Uh, but this conversation um, is about BE. And, and I want to take you back there because one of the things that really impressed me when I spent three weeks in China was 
was China's ability to assess where they're at, to assess whether what they've employed is working, and then to change it if it isn't. So my question really is, is the policy that we've put in place, not the spirit of the policy, the spirit of the policy is phenomenal, but is, is the policy that we put in place really achieving what we desire it to achieve? Is it helping people on the ground? And if it's not, surely just because it's law, we don't have to just accept it. Surely we say, this is not working for our people. Um, we still have the same intention, but maybe there's uh, a different way of, of approaching this thing. It, it, it's, 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 unacceptable that we have the society that, that we do have that is so unequal. And, and if it isn't working, can, can we be honest about it and say it's not working? We need to relook at this thing. I think you are absolutely correct that it could be improved just because we have erred in the implementation through cadre deployment, just because we have not succeeded in bringing the bottom half into the middle class. It's no reason to throw out the, uh, the, the baby with the bathwater. I think we need to re-examine where we can improve. We have notched some amazing progress, albeit uh, inadequate. We were adding 500,000 families into the black middle class. We have had 43 consecutive quarters of positive uh, GDP growth. Um, but of course, like I said, the need is much, much greater. But today, this is not the time to be saying, no, just because it's not working, therefore let's throw it out. I think when I started, I said, it's not either or, but both end. Of course we need industrialization. Of course we need the creation of entrepreneurs. But the reason why Transnet was so good in eliminating the poor Africana problem in 1972 is because it was used deliberately, purposefully, consciously to create artisans, uh, mill rights, uh, boiler makers and feeders. And today we've got huge companies like Ultron that were created out of that. Just because we have been short-sighted in this ANC-led government and we haven't created many companies, industries, that are monuments that we can point to for the next 50 years. This is not the time to start questioning 26 years into democracy as to whether it is working or not. Of course, we need to be absolutely critical, but I think the work is so large. We still have a situation where students go to the University of the Witwatersrand, Rand, which was formerly a white university, and they sleep in libraries and toilets, and they depend on other students to be fed uh, for the evening. Now, when you look at COVID-19 and we look at the three fundamental principles of social distancing, of working from home, of observing just general hygiene, one has to ask what social distancing will be effectively accomplished in Alexander and in Soweto with two and a half million people, more than the population of Botswana, Lesotho, Namibia, and Swaziland in a four-roomed house where on average there's five people living in that house and only two bedrooms. There can't be any meaningful social distancing. You can't say to people work from home when State South Africa tells us that only 14.3% of households have direct access internet in South Africa. And if we were to get into a taxi today on your way to Alexander, We seem to have lost uh, Bonang. Um, I have a, a comment from um, one of the people on the chat. In that taxi. I think those are the things that we need to deal with. Melanie, over to you. <clears throat> Thanks, Bonang. Um, we have a comment from uh, Zukiswa. Uh, Zukiswa says, B is a form of oppression period. We need the real entrepreneurs to come out, not tenderpreneurs. Um, Tash, I don't know if you've got any input as uh, far as that comment is concerned. I mean, I'll address that comment, but I think, you know, you had, Melanie, you, you brought up a really important point, which was um, being able to iterate and change things. Uh, Bonang said, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. This, this, to me, speaks to the way we've got to approach policy. Um, you know, in China, you've got a one-party state. If the state has a plan and they want it to go ahead, there's nobody that stands in the way. There's no... Uh, 
um, you know, dialogue with uh, society and communities and a whole lot of stakeholders. It's a decision and it's made. But I think what we can do is, in terms of making BE work better, because there are elements of it that can drive the entrepreneurship. Um, if we were to take enterprise and supplier development and work well with that, uh, strategically to create entrepreneurs in the value chains of, of, of large companies that have incredible IP that need to feed into these entrepreneurial businesses, um, we could get a version of enterprise and supplier development that could really nurture uh, these young businesses. But it's the way in which we are dogmatic around the policies that are in place, that we must defend them to the death rather than saying, let us try to iterate, let us try to use some of these modern innovation techniques like lean business model. Um, teach this to policymakers. Uh, you know, how do we get into a room and workshop how we can take something that's old uh, and, and modernize and put it into context. So if we look at South Korea, they uh, established what we call creative councils. It's in, in Europe, the innovation literature calls this regional innovation systems. And what you do in these models is you take large industry leaders who have pooled massive amounts of intellectual property, technologies, uh, competitive behaviors, and you allow them to, to create a, um, a community of practice with smaller businesses in that regional, in that, in that region. And there's a transfer of skill around uh, competitiveness and technology that goes into the smaller businesses. And, and this is what we need. You know, entrepreneurs, yes, they need basic business literacy skills. They do need capital. But most importantly, they need access into a market and they need access into the competitive technologies that the industry leaders have. So, so I still believe that within BE, we have tools to facilitate that kind of regional development um, and development of businesses on the competitive front and the technology front. A lot of what we focus on is just the capital or the, the, or the contracts, um, which is often a repackaging and not, uh, not, not an industrialization going on where we start manufacturing from scratch. It's I'll go and buy this from someone, I'll put a price tag on it and I'll on sell. Um, and, and BE done in that way is not going to work. But if we have real genuine enterprise development that's going on, that is how we can create new classes and cohorts of entrepreneurs in the country. Absolutely. And sometimes uh, we're our own worst enemies and the fact that we, we make uh, things so rigid, it's impossible to actually attain your objectives sometimes. You know, yeah. every single investment um, engagement that I've ever gone to overseas, any B2B kind of environment, people have always said, yeah, but you've got BE. Because if you look at the investment environment, people can invest wherever they want to. Um, they're going to invest where it's most conducive for them to be able to make profit. That's how they, how they work. If we put in place so many restrictions, um, then, then it's, we're not the top choice in that place. We want to, to change our economy, so surely it makes more uh, sense to incentivize it, to roll out the red carpet, to be competitive, and to say, if you achieve X, Y, and Z, then we'll incentivize it to this degree. Um, well, let's see, what are your thoughts on, on uh, investment in BE? Well, well my, my own view is, is that we, we have to develop an ethos of an integrated society in South Africa. We have to get away from advantaging this racial group and disadvantaging that racial group. If we operate like that, we will never get anywhere. We, we have to have equality amongst all South Africans, irrespective of their race, and, and, and the issue of, of our past we can spend all our lives crying about the past. When I go to China and I have worked for a Chinese company, I was a consultant for five years to Sino Steel in, in, in Limpopo. <clears throat> the Chinese are focused on how to make China work. They are not focused about crying about how Japan exploited them and therefore they must get reparations from the Japanese and therefore Japan must give them 
X, Y, Z. So to me, I think what is important for South Africa is we must build a, com a common South Africa, a common community of South Africa. And that is a priority. If we don't have a common community of South Africa and we are advantaging this group, advantaging that other group, disadvantaging this group, then our economy will be where it is today for the coming hundred years. It will be stuck where it is today. If you compare uh, South Korea to South Africa, the South African economy is a fraction of the Korean economy. Why? Because of South Africa's position, policies of excluding this section of the population and excluding that section of the population. The Koreans brought all Koreans together. A Korean housewife, the Korean government, makes sure that even if she's not working, she is computer literate so that she can communicate with a, a child at primary school and is part of the education of the child and is part of the, uh, of the technology of, of, of Korea. This, to me, is the mindset that is lacking in South Africa. We can tweak this, we can tweak this law, tweak that law, uh, but if we don't have a mindset of building a, a new country and integrating our whole population, we will never get there. Thank you. That uh, leads on to some really interesting conversations about um, about countries where integration has been planned. I mean, if you if you think about the fact that uh, that apartheid was a, was a physical, it was a psychological, it was a, a legislative um, structure that's got to be reorganized. I mean, we really haven't uh, we haven't reorganized our country along a lot of lines. We still have townships. Why do we still have townships? Anyway, that's a whole other uh, conversation. An interesting thing that you did bring up was uh, the disparity in, in education, because surely um, access to market and creating a situation where you have a potential advantage, uh, considered a fair advantage through BE, is only fair if you, if you have the other tools that allow you to take advantage of that. Now, education system in South Africa uh, does not uh, give people an equal footing to start on. Um, Bunong? Uh, can I have some input from you on, on, on why we haven't managed to fix education um, and whether it's an important element uh, in this whole uh, conversation? But you see, the issue of leveling the playing field is absolutely critical and we didn't invent it. After the Great Depression in the US of A, they came up with this notion of um, an acre and a mule to try and deal with the issues of colonialism. During the martial law after the Second World War, when the economy of the whole of Europe, now called the EU 28 member state, um, to try and deal with that devastation. In Malaysia, we had the Bumiputra um, experience after which part of our own constitution is drafted after because they were realizing that the indigenous Chinese people were actually owning and commanding the height of the economy to the exclusion of the indigenous Malay people. Singapore does exactly the same thing. Canada's constitution had to codify in law the percentage representation of women. Therefore, you can't run away from the fact that we need some intervention in strategy because if you leave it only to nature, you will have what we have today, 26 years into democracy, white male Africaners are still occupying 79% of the C-suite. And yet the majority of women and black people are still languishing and asking for food parcels in an informal settlement. The issue of education, as you ask, Melanie, is absolutely key. And even education. This education has been fixed primarily because for years, you see, the design of apartheid education was to ensure that we never teach an African child mathematics so that they never rise above certain forms of labor. Only now are we trying to equalize that, therefore totally ignoring 
this 350 years of exclusion and say, no, 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 we are now equal. Everybody has boots and shoelaces with which they need to pull themselves up with, totally ignores reality. Education matters, not only because after 30 years, um, you can get out of an informal settlement and be able to afford a house in the leafy suburbs of Bryanston, purely and simply because you have ended to deserve it. Education is the greatest leveler, purely and simply because now, with the removal of the apartheid system, we are now getting to a system where we say, can we prepare our own kids for the fourth industrial revolution? There is no way that we are going to say, oh no, for us to be uh, this nice rainbow nation of Mandela, today, 26 years into democracy, let's forget that for 350 years, for 48 years of apartheid, that the minors are still living in single-sex hostels, that um, the, the dilapidation in Ankanja and Emondro in the dusty hills of KwaZulu-Natal need to be genuinely fixed and fundamentally um, uh, uh, absolutely uprooted before we build something that is meaningful and indeed of value. Melanie Petri. Thank you, Bunang. So, I mean, you raised some really important things there. So we're saying, you know, BE also, although it, it intends to address the, the, the issues of inequality in the country, is, is some would say it's, it's kind of run its course and the people that have benefited from BE and the structural change that's taken place in our economy is going to perpetuate now. So people that are in the middle class, their kids get a better education and so they'll perpetuate that cycle of ensuring that, that, that people in, in, in the echelons that they're in at the moment maintain those positions. But people that are, that are lost, that are excluded from the economy uh, are not going to benefit from it. It's education that's going to make that change. So do, do we keep doing the same thing over and over or do, do we look for a new way uh, to include people in the economy? You brought up a really important thing about the fourth industrial revolution um, in, our, in the discussion there. You know, one of the biggest frustrations for me is that I, that I recently secured funding from a corporate to, to train um, 30 agricultural graduates as drone pilots, which makes them employable tomorrow because of the applications for agriculture. I've got accredited training, I've got young people I've identified, I've got funding and I can't train them because why? Because the, although the uh, drone pilot training has gone through a civil aviation approval, it isn't approved by the CETA. It's stuck in the CETA system so people can't get their BE points. So I've got 30 people I can't train because, because of, of red tape. I think that if, uh, my question to you then is if we took this, uh, this off the table and allowed people in the spirit, as Moletti says, of building a unified South Africa with all common interest of achieving this goal of greater equality, wouldn't it be easier um, if we allowed all businesses to thrive and didn't hold back some with the hope of pulling some forward? If we all got behind uh, an idea to bring people up to a more equal society, if, if people were allowed to, to take the restrictions that are placed on them, could they not grow and employ more people? Would we not attract more investment? Would growing the pie not make more sense um, than where we currently find ourselves? Absolutely. But you see, we shouldn't cherry pick the things that will make South Africa work. What we need is to make sure that the 58.78 million South Africans stop being beneficiaries of charity. When work is defined not as job creation, but as creating markets of the future, then we have got a better chance. Because the problem is when you produce goods and services that your own employees cannot afford, then clearly you have a problem. When we speak about obscene wealth, this thing that we call summer place today it's Palazzolo who bought a house of a neighbor next door for 36 million and then simply ravaged it to the ground to create the modern guard for 36 million. We still have that happening today in Stellenbosch and yet the majority of the, the colleagues in Marikana live in informal settlements and we drive there every morning on our way to London without it pricking our conscience to say, what is it that we can do to mobilize the force, the impetus of business, to make sure that grown men and women that work 
at Marikana and indeed in London can have bricks and mortar as their own homes so that they can have their dignity back and their self-worth. The challenge in South Africa is exactly that, to say how then do we ensure that in increasing the size of the pie, we don't continue to focus on the top 1%, only 90% of the wealth. When we talk about equality, we're not talk, just talking about income equality, we're also talking about wealth equality. And at the moment, the black majority have absolutely no assets. When we talk about land expropriation without compensation, the bigger agenda is about land reform where the two and a half million Soweto people can have just a title deed and they go and leverage that to start their own businesses. That's entrepreneurship. But at the moment, they don't even have enough money just to buy a bucket of archer to sell at a profit so that they can perpetuate uh, this commerce that is going on. The biggest constraint, uh, of course, is skills, but the biggest constraints to small and medium enterprises is how do they access finance so that they can start their own businesses. Uh, a, a lot of people have brilliant ideas, uh, but because of the red tape, uh, because of the inflexibility of really focusing on the have not, because that's where our future is intertwined um, to look at a brighter tomorrow compared to today. Melanie. Thank you so much. I think, uh, I think that we all agree that we've got collectively got to solve this problem. Uh, and the question really under discussion today is, is, is BE the vehicle to take us there? Is it getting in our way or is it actually helping to solve the problems that we, that we face in this space? Um, and then the other question that we had to face today is during this time when businesses are under the most immense pressure just to survive, all this red tape and all this expense that is associated with BE, shouldn't it be something that is temporarily suspended while we, while we collectively look at it and say, is this, is this the vehicle that's going to take us where we ultimately want to get? Tash, your input on that. Yeah, I, I, f I fully agree with that sentiment. It was something that was raised in the in, in the chat. Um, uh, you know, for example, I'll just give you a practical example with yes. Uh, you have to be performing on the priority elements uh, with a 50% average in order to just participate in yes. So if you're a company that says, look, um, other parts of the scorecard don't make too much sense for me now. I want to invest in youth jobs and get a level up for that. You actually can't. So this is the kind of example, and you described an example also with this, this course that you wanted to run. And I think that the red tape does need to be relaxed. I think we'll see a lot more progress and movement of companies in BE. We work with companies often, and we see how they're caught up in red tape where they actually want to do something meaningful. They want to contribute. They want to grow the economy. They want to give someone a chance. But there's some little rule that makes it impossible. Uh, the, the issue is going to be how you practically implement a relaxing of the rules because there's so many of them. How, you, how do you decide which ones you relax and which you don't relax? Um, you know, personally, in the yes space, we, we think that job creation at the moment is so important that we should take away the sub-minimums to participate in the program. If you want to join YES and create jobs, and they're eight-month jobs and not 12-month jobs, or you want to do it, but you don't have all of your ownership points and your enterprise and supply development points right, you should still be able to invest in those youth jobs through the program. Um, and of course, people operating in other segments of the, of the BE scorecard will say the same. The, the, the trick is going to be to have a much more um, agile relationship between business and the policymakers on BEE, that there needs to be much faster turnaround in decisions and, um, and, and taking idea, good ideas forward. At the moment, the turnaround time between an idea, how we can relax a rule to get bigger impact is an extremely lengthy process. Um, so, so I just, I, I really believe that within government and government departments that are responsible for, for, for the, the policy amendments and the implementation of those policies, there needs to be uh, communities of practice with people in the economy who are actually live trying to make those work. 
and there needs to be a much more informed uh, 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 a policy process you know the kind of thing where you ask for comments and the comments are collected and it's you know several months down the line that simply isn't good enough everything that we need to get right in the country for me comes down to execution and implementation and the speed and the people that we have doing that you've got to have people who are ready for change you know one of the issues with 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 taking be out altogether is all economies not just ours but but especially so in ours um human beings don't like change that's the first one most people would like to get up every day and do things exactly the way they were doing it the day before not because they're evil people but because it's the easier way to do things and that's human wiring right i want to i want to get into some kind of hamster wheel and 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 not think about what i have to do every day that's the first is human nature the second is all economies run on social networks and you click so if there isn't some kind of rule system that forces you to change your behavior and forces you to give other people a chance you are going to be continuously using your social network that you know and trust and you will continue doing business with them so i do think that we need an adjustment of the way policy is is implemented it needs to be faster and it needs to take uh, uh, it needs to be agile and have more diverse interests represented but we also can't get rid of it and relax the rules to the point where it makes it too easy to carry on with the status quo and not change your behavior so so that's the balancing act um, that I, that i think we need to get right as a as a society and as government so what would you say to to incentivizing the achievement of um of of be rather than using a stick i mean in, in this instance you get a lot of people that come back and say you know you kind of excluding me you're saying i'm not worth the same sort of level so then i'm ticking boxes i'm not actually committed to to transformation but if you invite me to the table to be part of it a uh, rebuilding of our country where everybody matters aren't you likely to have a better result that comes out of that than than to use a stick i'm just saying you can have a carrot or you Absolutely. can have Absolutely but that's that's how yes works right this is why i'm saying yes was quite an innovation with the dti and business to work together because government's not putting any money into yes but they're saying if you invest as the private sector in jobs you get a level up that's a, that's that's a rewards based and it's worked we've got 35000 uh one year job opportunities because government gave that incentive or reward to companies who would invest so i think uh the, the the carrot approach is much better than the stick but you know right at the beginning bonang talked about uh, glass ceilings uh and and i don't think that uh, you know that in, was a particular reference to women in the economy and the benefits of having greater inclusion of women in the economy would bring but the kind of click that keeps women out um of of positions of power are the same sorts of networks and cliques that will keep young black entrepreneurs out so we we mustn't ignore the power of those social networks uh they, they we need something that is uh um some kind of reward system that incentivizes and breaks those cliques apart i think that's absolutely right moletsi um i'd like to hear from you um what do you think we should be doing during this covid-19 people are seem to be saying that it's an opportunity for us to reimagine the structure of our economy uh, what are your thoughts on that well i think every opportunity we need to take advantage of every opportunity uh if it helps us to start to think differently to start to be more creative to start to get out of the the, the boxes that uh that we we have boxed ourselves into now it's very very clear in south africa what for example we have huge rural to urban migration and many years ago i proposed to the south african government that we have to build a new town in lanseria i noticed that the president has now uh, hijacked my idea and calls it his own idea but i i proposed to 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 then uh, president mandela that we need to build new towns so that the people who are coming from the rural areas 
are not, don't end up in the shanty towns like that's where they end up too. I put this to the ANC government, I put it to Helen Zille in, the Cape, in Cape Town, and I said to her, we in the private sector are willing to work with you to clear the slums and make sure people are accommodated in proper accommodation. When I raised this with, with, with Helen Zille, she was more worried that will this not encourage more people to come from the rural area to Cape Town. So I said to her, that's a sign of success. If people come to your city, you must, it means you're succeeding, but you have to find a way. Let's build more satellite towns in Cape Town. Let's build more satellite towns in, outside our, our big cities. So these are the, 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 the challenges that, that, that we, we, we have to have. But my sad thing about South Africans, especially the middle class in South Africa, and I'm especially disappointed with the, with the black middle class, especially the African middle class, is they have totally forgotten where they come from. They have totally forgotten about the poor people, in the rural areas, the poor people in the slums, what COVID-19 has done is this middle class now suddenly realize that if COVID-19 embeds itself in, the, in these poor neighborhoods, then somewhere along the line, it will come to their suburbs as well. So now they are starting to think, what should we do about the welfare of, of these people? But you know, their first thought is bring out the army. Let's bring out the army uh, uh, and station the army against the poor people. Instead of building the new towns, instead of setting up, for example, why don't we have members of parliament with constituencies? One of the huge problems this government has with communicating with people, and this has been said to them many times, if you don't have constituencies, people don't have an elected representative who they have elected themselves, who is their direct representative to the government. So these are the dynamics that are needed now. We have to have, we, you don't have constituencies because it's a nice to have. You have constituencies because it establishes a line of communication between the government and the people, that member of parliament who is elected by the people, and it doesn't matter what party they belong to, the people have not recognized that member of parliament as their representative, and then you will, we won't be having army like we, the government is now uh, having the army. Instead, we would have the members of parliament, the councillors, uh, and so on, as a line of communication between the state and the ordinary people. So that, the, that's the new thinking that COVID-19 is showing us. The, the army cannot make it possible for people to have social distance. You can have as much army as you like. You can have as many guns as you like. If you are living in a shanty town, you haven't got the ability to socially distance. So, so we have this, this is what COVID-19 is showing us, is that if there is to be a future of South Africa, and now the experts are telling us we fa we're facing 40,000 people dying before the end of this, of this year. This should never, ever have happened because we neglected the housing the, of, of the poor people in this country. And, and I'm not talking about theory. I have talked, for example, to Lindy Wessasulu when she was Minister of Housing. I said to her, come with me, I will show you very good high-rise buildings for working class people in London. We should do the same thing in South Africa. Uh, Well-managed, high-rise buildings, you can build them quickly. You can do three or four or five bedrooms, for people with bigger families and so on. She turned around to me saying, no, that's not suitable for us. 
but she couldn't explain why it is suitable for the working class in England, but not suitable for the working class in South Africa. So, so this is one of the problems. This is one of the things that COVID-19 is doing, is bringing, as they say, the chicken coming home to roost to the ANC government and the DAA government in the Western Cape for neglecting the welfare of the poor people in this country. Perfect, thank you. BE Innovation, can we have the results of the polls that, we've, that you've run? We can make those available and then we'll, uh, I'm conscious of time, so we'll have to do a, a bit of a wrap up. Should be temporarily suspended. We've got 40% saying yes and 60% saying no. Um, and the other poll that you ran, Uh, do you think uh, B, triple BEE produces entrepreneurs or tenderpreneurs um, an opportunity for economic growth? So uh, between tenderpreneurs and an opportunity for economic growth, it seems, are uh, running at 47%. So that's interesting. So um, I just want to, to close. Um, so I'd like each of you to give us your thoughts. I started by saying the three things that drive me crazy are injustice. And I think we've spoken um, quite at length about the injustice that we have in our country that the certainty that we need to address. But the other things I said, I just, I really just like were dogma and illogical rules. So my question to you are, uh, in closing, do you believe that um, Triple BE has achieved what it was intended to achieve? Um, if not, is there, uh, is there some logic in, in revisiting uh, the policies that we have in place? And finally, do you believe that um, it should be, uh, the obligations should be suspended whilst companies um, recover um, from COVID-19? Over to you, um, Bonang. Melanie, one of the sad things in South Africa today is that the structure of the South African economy gives poor people absolutely no chance because poor people on average live 40 kilometers away from their place of work and as a result they spend 40 percent of their salaries on transport if you include food it's more than 60 percent therefore they will never be able to save in their lives secondly china has proved itself as the center of the supply chain of most countries in the world, touching 193 countries. Japan says to its own people in China, bring your factories back to Japan, for which will give you a 1.2 trillion US dollar incentive. China responds by saying, if you buy local, we will give you each 3,500, especially if those things are produced here at home. So this notion of localization has been exposed by COVID-19. What is then going to be our response? And our response can only be, can we manufacture more things here in South Africa? Can we ensure that we are self-sufficient? Can we reduce our over-reliance on other markets? And the only way to do that is to ensure that the 90% of the population that is black, the 51% that is female, definitely benefits when we restructure, reconfigure, reimagine this economy because it cannot continue to go to the usual suspects. Lastly, the definition of triple BE is that it's a planned and positive process and strategy that is aimed at transforming the socio-economic environment that excluded individuals from previously disadvantaged groups in order for these individuals to gain access to opportunities, including developmental opportunities based on their suitability. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you so much. Tash, over to you. Sure. You know, your, your first question was, uh, do you believe in the relevance of, of, of BEE? And we, we've, all of our youth that we place in market get smartphones. And the smartphones are zero rated on, on Yes apps. So they can do training and learning and we can communicate with them via surveys and assessments continuously. So we've been asking them questions uh, during COVID. How have you been impacted um, as a Yes youth? 
70% of our youth have responded that they are supporting other members of their household with their YES salary. Most of our YES companies have been incredible in continuing to pay youth during this lockdown. So these 35,000 young people out there, the 1.4 billion in salaries, the amazing stories that we get back from young people who are so grateful for this opportunity to break into the world of work. I have to say, I believe in BEE. It is the DTI Gazette Amendment that made these jobs possible. So when we are innovative, when we make amendments, when we do things right, the impacts are there and, and they're there for all to see. So I have to believe that this is a great vehicle. But when you talk about should we relax elements of this, I'm totally with you. I think that in, in such unprecedented times, everybody, every business, every policymaker, every department needs to be looking at the way they've done things and the way they could be doing things. You are disconnected from your reality and those are the worst types of policies and departments uh, and businesses who do not adapt and change and say, how do we do this better given the circumstances? I think that if we relax the rules to make it easier to comply, um, we can actually use BE really cleverly during this time. Thank you, that's great. Moletzi, your last thoughts, please. Well, my last thought is, uh, as I started, my last thought is that what we need to do in South Africa is to create an integrated nation in South Africa. BEE does not do that. They are, uh, and uh, Tash and, and, and Wanang have shown some good elements that are there in BEE. But to me, these are, big, these are small, uh, contributions. We have to think big. We have to think uh, about a big future for the future of South Africa. It, as long as we are picking on the edges of existing problems, then we will never have a South Africa that is on the scale of China or on the scale of England or on the scale of the United States. South Africa can be on the scale of England, can be on the scale of the United States. But we have to think big. And to think big, it means every South African must work. Every South African adult must be productive. So that we don't have people, for example, if you go to the rural areas, to the communal areas, People spend huge amount of time, women going to fetch water or going to look for wood. Why? But we have huge amount of gas in Africa. Why is there no natural gas network in the whole of, of South Africa? I was in Korea at the beginning of this year. The whole country in South Korea is, has a, a gas network so that every corner of the country you can switch on your stove and you put on your gas and the gas is there we have huge amount of gas in angola huge amount of gas in mozambique why aren't we building a pipeline and then supply gas to the whole population of south africa whether they are in the rural area or or in in the in the urban area so we have to stop thinking these little reforms of this little bit here, little bit there. We have to think about building a real South Africa. To, we can set up gas pipeline, Mozambique and Tanzania. Tanzania is a thousand kilometers away. The pipelines in Western Europe from Russia are over 3000 kilometers. Why aren't we building a pipeline from Tanzania to bring gas to South Africa so that the women in the rural areas don't have to be spending their lives going to look uh, for wood in instead of uh, using gas to, to cook at home or to heat their homes and so on. So to me, my thought is BE, 
that was a solution for big business to protect itself. They have succeeded. <laughs> they, they now have these guys in their pockets. So good luck to them. But we have to move on to a different South Africa. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I think the important thing to take out of today is I hope you've been challenged. I hope your thinking's been challenged and I hope that it brings South Africans together um, uh, to think big, to make a difference for, for all South Africans. Thank you, uh, Lee, for inviting me. I'm going to hand over to you so that you can close up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. And a really big thank you again to all our panelists. Uh, it was a really interesting conversation. I've been lots of WhatsApp messages coming through and I've been trying to follow some of the comments as well. And uh, people are certainly finding it very interesting. Um, some are agreeing and some are not with certain points, but we can't get into any additional debates right now. Um, well, let's see, I'm looking forward to picking up this conversation with you when we can, when we can meet again in person, uh, even though we don't always agree. Um, I always enjoy those engagements. Tash, uh, yes, we'll continue to have the support from B Innovation and we will continue to advocate for um, yes as much as possible. We're big believers in it. And Bonang, thank you also. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, engaging you further on, on what else can be done. Thank you to all the participants. Um, there was a question that I'll respond to quickly. Somebody asked about recording availability. Um, yes, this was recorded. We'll find a way to make it available to those who ask. Um, and there was a question about BE verification during lockdown. So we do have a, a tech-based solution, um, a digital verification solution with our technology partner. Talk to us about that and we can help you there. And then I'll just close by mentioning some of the upcoming webinars that we have. Um, we're going to be doing a, um, a discussion with uh, YES, um, helping uh, companies understand the technical questions they have and helping them um, answer those for yes implementation. We'll be, we've got another one coming up with a, a DAMP who's going to be uh, explaining the DA's position on why they believe lockdown should um, be raised. And um, he's going to have um, uh, Kaya Sitole with him who believes lockdown um, should remain in force. So that's going to be an interesting debate. And then finally, we've got a, uh, an international panel coming up uh, where we've got an American economist who uh, understands public health and has spent a lot of time in South Africa. Um, she'll be giving her perspective on the economics of COVID. Um, and we've got somebody representing the European Chambers who will be talking about um, European Chambers in Taiwan. He'll be talking about Taiwan's response to the COVID crisis and how they had one of the um, best responses in the world. So, Thank you again for all our guests and thank you again to um, all our panelists and uh, we hope we'll see you on our next one. Please make sure you sign up for our newsletter and we'll keep you updated. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.